Happy New Year, Madam Speaker. And it is 2024, and the, this Prime Minister is still not worth the cost. He's not worth the crime. He's not worth giving up the country that we know and love. But after eight years, everything costs more. Crime is ri r running rampant. Housing costs have doubled. The country is more divided than ever before, and the Prime Minister seeks to distract and attack anyone who disagrees with him in order to make people forget how miserable he's turned life in this country after nearly a decade in power. Our common sense counterpoint, though, is very focused. In this session of Parliament, we will fight to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. Again, yes. In case you missed it, axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, stop the crime. Axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, stop the crime. That's how we're going to turn around the mess the Prime Minister has created in eight years. Let us quickly touch upon that mess. After eight years of this Prime Minister, housing costs have doubled. This is after he promised that, that those housing costs would go down. In fact, they rose 40 percent faster than incomes. The, the worst gap in the G7 by far, the second worst among all 40 OECD nations, twice as bad as the OECD average, with roughly a quarter of OECD countries actually seeing housing affordability improve over the last uh, eight years. Here in Canada, under this Prime Minister, we have seen them worsen at the fastest rate in the entire G7. He has created a situation where only 26 percent of Canadians believe that are, are able to afford a single family home. It now takes 25 years to save up for a down payment on the average home for the average Toronto family. 25 years used to be the time it took to pay off a mortgage. After eight years of this Prime Minister, it is now more affordable to buy a 20-bedroom castle in Scotland than a two-bedroom condo in Kitchener. After eight years of this Prime Minister, a criminal defence lawyer reported on Twitter that numerous of her clients have asked if she could help extend their prison sentences so that they don't have to go and live in the housing market and find a place to rent. In other words, this Prime Minister's housing market is worse than prison uh, by the judgment of uh, several people who actually live in prison. After eight years of this Prime Minister, I, we have seniors crammed 16 into a, into a four-bedroom home in Oshawa. That's according to the food bank uh, who told me they had to house middle-class seniors together. They are all losing their homes because of this incredible rent increase that this Prime Minister's policies have caused. We have uh, homelessness uh, is skyrocketing across the country. Every town and centre now has homeless encampments. Halifax has 30 homeless encampments, 30 for one medium-sized city after eight years of this Prime Minister. Who would have imagined that we would have 30 homeless encampments in one city? But that is the misery that he has created through his policies that are not worth the cost of housing. Meanwhile, he makes the problem worse. He gives tax dollars to incompetent mayors and bureaucracies to block home building. Uh, the worst incompetence, of course, has been the mayors of Toronto and uh, the former mayor and the present mayor of Toronto, the former mayor of Vancouver, uh, blocking construction in those cities and making it uninhabitable for many of the people who should be able to afford a home. It, it, we now have the second slowest building permits of any country in the OECD. That's why we have the fewest homes in the G7, even with the most land by far to build on. And we were told that the media darling uh, M Minister uh, of Housing, who was brought in in March, uh, excuse me, in fall, was going to fix all this. He was going to hold photo ops right across the country, and all of a sudden there would be more building. What happened? Housing construction actually went down. 7% reduction in housing last year under the leadership of the current housing minister. But is it any surprise that when you put the guy in, who destroyed our immigration system in charge of housing, you get a, a, a destructive result? And don't accuse, don't, don't, it's not me accusing him of ruining the immigration system. It's his own liberal successor. His own, the current liberal minister of immigration 
says the system is out of control. In his own words, he claims that his predecessor was giving study visas for students to come and study at what he calls puppy mills. Those are his terms. I would never have used that term. It's insulting. They're actually human beings. They're not dogs, Madam Speaker. But that's the, that's the language we get from the current immigration minister to describe the chaos that his own predecessor caused in the student, uh, uh, international student program, the temporary foreign worker program, not to mention countless other programs that have been now overwhelmed by fraudsters and shady consultants and bureaucratic incompetence. Now they take the guy who ruined all of that and they say, this is the guy we're going to bring in to resolve the housing crisis. No wonder it gets worse and worse by the day. With their only, their only defense is that they're spending lots of money. Wow. Failing is bad, Madam Speaker. Failing expensively is even worse. And that is what this Prime Minister has done after eight years. It is not only in housing, it is in generalized inflation. After eight years, inflation hit 40-year 40, uh, 40 highs. Uh, after eight years, this Prime Minister has increased the, the cost of food so quickly that there are now two million Canadians, a record-smashing number, who are required to go to food banks in a single month. We have students forced to live in homeless shelters in order to afford food. We have seniors who say they had to live in they have to live in tents in order to be able to shop and feed themselves because food prices have risen so high. In fact, in Van excuse me, in Toronto, one in ten Torontonians are now going to a food bank. Enough to fill the Rogers Center seven times. If the monthly users of the food bank in Toronto alone were to, to go to the, to the Rogers Centre, you'd have to fill the place seven separate times just to accommodate them all. Who would have thought that you'd have this many hungry people in Canada's biggest city, a city that has elected no, no one but Liberals since 2015, and this is the result they've gotten from it? In that same city, crime and chaos rage out of control. In the adjoining suburbs, now we have stories of extortions where small businesses receive letters that if they don't fork over big dollars to international crime syndicates, they will be shot at, their houses will be burned, their families will be targeted, and the government does nothing to protect them. Who would have thought that Canada would be so vulnerable to this kind of criminality and chaos that these foreign criminal syndicates would think Canada so weak and so easy to target that they could go after innocent s small business leaders and their families in order to shake them down for money, and yet that is what has happened. And these same business owners go to bed at night with one eye open because they know their car could be stolen as they sleep. Uh, I've been, I told some stories yesterday to the caucus, of incredible stories, of uh, people in Brampton whose cars just vanish in the middle of the night then they go over to Montreal where they're put on a ship and sent off to the Middle East or Africa or Europe where they're resold at a profit. And they're not even inspected as they go onto the ships with these containers. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister spends billions of dollars trying to buy back the legitimate property of licensed law-abiding firearms owners. He believes that the problem is the hunter from Nunavut or the professional sports shooter from uh, Nanaimo, when in fact the real problem is the criminals. Common sense conservatives are going to put an end to this madness. We're going to bring home the country we know and love. Now let's go through the common sense plan. One, we're going to bring home lower prices by axing the carbon tax. And it starts with passing Bill C. Two, three, four, to ax the tax on farmers and food so farmers can make the food and Canadians can afford to eat it. Pass the bill unamended today and let Canadians eat affordable food. It's, it's very easy. The House of Commons passed it once before. The Senate, under duress and pressure from this Prime Minister, then sent it back with unnecessary amendments. Now the other opposition parties are flip-flopping and wavering. They agree in principle with the Liberal plan to quadruple the carbon tax, but 
they said, well, we, we might consider giving the farmers a break on it. Well, now they're not so sure. They're siding with this costly Prime Minister again on keeping the tax on our farmers. And every time our people go to the grocery store and see those rising prices, they will know that the NDP has betrayed working class people in favour of greedy government with higher taxes on farmers and higher taxes on the single moms who are struggling to feed their, their families. Mr. Speaker, uh, Madam Speaker, we are going to axe the tax on home heat, not just for some or for a, a, a short time, but for everybody, everywhere, always. Common sense Conservatives call on the Prime Minister to be consistent. Don't just temporarily pause the tax in regions where your polls are plummeting and your caucus is revolting. Rather, let's axe the tax for every Canadian household to heat their homes in this devastatingly cold winter. Incredible. In Edmonton, the, how, how, how cold did it get in Edmonton? Minus 50. Minus 50. And the Liberal member for Edmonton Centre voted to tax the heat of Edmontonians. Not only that, the Liberal member for Edmonton Centre wants to quadruple the carbon tax on the home heat of Edmontonians. So over the next several years, as the winter cold comes in and the people crank up their heat, their bills will rise faster and faster. Some places now, the carbon tax is more expensive than the actual gas that people are buying. Uh, the bills, I mean, some of my caucus members, we're going to be sharing these bills. If you have any bills, with carbon tax itemized, let's share them so that everybody knows how badly this Prime Minister and his NDP coalition are ripping off Canadians for the crime of heating themselves in minus 50 weather. We are the only party that will axe the tax for them, for, every, for everyone, everywhere, always, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Our common sense plan to bring home lower prices includes capping spending, capping the spending that has driven the inflation, a $600 billion uh, increase in spending and debt, which means printing money. Uh, printing money bids up the goods we buy and the interest we pay. In fact, government spending is up 75 per cent since this Prime Minister took office. He's nearly doubled the cost of the government in a time when the economy has barely grown at all. In fact, the economy is shrinking while the government is expanding, which means that the government is gobbling up an increasing share of a shrinking pie. And that means there's less left for everyone else. Right now, the government is rich and the people are poor. The government is rich and the people are poor because this Prime Minister cannot stop spending and his greedy NDP coalition counterparts push, the pro push him to, to spend even more of other people's money. Our common sense plan would cap spending and cut waste. We'll get rid of the $35 billion infrastructure bank, the $54 million Arrive Can app, the billion dollar so called green uh, fund. It's a really a slush fund. We will uh, get, cut back on the money wasted on consultant insiders who now consume 21 billion tax dollars a year, an amount that is equal to $1,400 for every family in Canada. We will be cutting back on this waste so that we can balance the budget and bring down inflation and interest rates so that Canadians can eat, heat and house themselves. We are going to unleash the growth of our economy. Instead of creating more cash, we're going to create more of what cash buys. We have the most powerful resources, perhaps the greatest supply of natural resources per capita of any country on earth, and we are very good at harvesting those resources to the benefit of our people and our environment at the same time. This Prime Minister, with the help of the NDP, has been driving the production to other countries where they pollute more, where they burn more coal, where they add more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. This Prime Minister would drive the production away from Canadians who use the cleanest electricity, among the cleanest electricity grids on planet Earth, instead of bringing it home here to this country. Our common sense plan will repeal C-69 and replace it with a new law that protects the environment, consults First Nations, but gets projects built that we can bring home the paychecks for our people and take the money away from the dirty dictators of the world. Yeah. And I know we 
I was able to announce recently that our new candidate in the Skeena Bulkley Valley riding is the great Alice Ross, former chief of the Hesla First Nation, who is responsible for bringing Canada the biggest ever investment in its history. That is the LNG Canada project, a project that was approved by the former Harper government. And the only reason it was able to go ahead under this government is because they gave the project an exemption from the carbon tax. Had the tax applied, the project never would have occurred. Had C-69, the anti-resource law, been in place, the project never would have happened. And by the government's own admission, this project will reduce greenhouse gas emissions around the world by millions of tons because it will displace dirty coal-fired electricity in Asia by sending clean, green Canadian natural gas, liquefied using hydroelectricity and our natural cold weather, sent abroad on our, on our shortest shipping distances, which means burning less fossil fuels to get it to market. This will displace more emissions-intensive forms of energy in countries where they need to cut back. That is a solution to fight climate change and protect our environment. And thank God we had the visionary leadership of the great Ellis Ross to make that project happen, along with Stephen Harper. <laughs> Unfortunately, this Prime Minister has blocked every other LNG project from coming to fruition. There were 18 of these projects on the table when he took office. Not one of them is completed. Only LNG, the aforementioned, oh, we got a cheer over there. Oh, we got a cheer over there. It was, it was one of the, uh, oh, that's that, the Marxist member from, uh, what's your writing again? Sorry? Rosemont Petit Patry, uh, he took that Marxist comment as a compliment, by the way. Um, I, I, believe me, he's told me that off the record. Uh, he tells me, uh, Mr. Sp he tells us that he's speaking perhaps uh, on behalf of the NDP. He cheers when he hears that this Prime Minister has blocked every LNG project. Well, that's, that's going to be very interesting news for me to take to northern British Columbia, where the First Nations people, the Niska, he cheers at the thought that the NISCA will lose out on their proposed natural gas liquefaction project. That is the NDP of today, Madam Speaker. They used to stand up for the workers who had the lunch buckets. They used to stand up for First Nations people. That is a bygone era. Now they cheer every time a working class person loses a job and a community loses its industry. Shame on them. Good news, they will not be part of my government. We will stand with the Niska, we will stand with the Hezla, we will stand uh, with the other First Nations of, the, of, of Northern Ontario who want to see the Ring of Fire go ahead. The First Nations people want to harvest our resources to empower their people and give their and end poverty. And we as Conservatives will remove the government gatekeepers and the radical ideologues like that NDP member and the current environment minister so that we can get things built and bring it home to our country. <laughs> Madam, Madam Speaker, those powerful paychecks will fund schools, roads and hospitals. They will improve our finances and that's what I mean when I say fix the budget. Yes, we have to cap spending and cut waste. That's the spending side of the income statement. But we also have to bring in more revenue at lower tax rates. How do we do that? We allow more production. We have bigger and more powerful industrial projects and resource uh, achievements. More paychecks for the people in the communities that work on those job sites will generate the tax revenue at a lower cost to the overall population so that we can fund our cherished social safety net with real money and in sustainably into the future, Madam Speaker. That is how you fix the budget. You make more and cost less to deliver better results for the Canadian people. Better results. The most basic result, though, is to have a, a roof over your head. And after eight years of this Prime Minister, that is not possible. We are going to remove the bureaucracy that stands in the way of home building. The reason we have the fewest homes per capita in the G7 is because we have the, the worst bureaucracy and the slowest permitting. My common sense plan will require local bureaucracies, 
permit 15 percent more homes per year as a condition of getting federal money. Those that beat the target will get more money. Those that miss the target will get less, and in exact proportion to their success or failure. We pay realtors based on the homes they sell. We pay builders based on the homes they build. We should pay local bureaucracies based on the homes they permit. That will speed them up and get them moving. And by the way, we will do it in a non-prescriptive way. There are countless different ways a municipality can allow more housing. So for example, today we learned one of the ways that cities block housing is by making renovations harder to permit. You might think, well, what does a renovation have to do with new homes? Well, if you want to renovate your home to create a basement suite or a, an over-the-garage suite or perhaps um, have a guest house on your property uh, that is a con converted from a, an old garage or something like that, you need a renovation permit. Now, that might be holding up the housing. Well, my plan would give a credit to the city and therefore more federal money if they allow for that, the rapid conversion of one house into two or uh, of a, a basement into a suite. Now, th this is why, I, the reason I spoke, spoke focus on this is because the, pr the Prime Minister has a, a proposal right now, he calls it the Housing Accelerator, where he has federal bureaucrats go and assess the processes of municipal bureaucrats. And the bureaucrats talk about the way the things should work. That would be like scoring the hockey game by having the referee go to the practices of the game, uh, of the players, and test whether they're doing the right skating drills, or whether they're doing the right pre-game pre pre stretching, or whether their diet plan is the best plan, rather than the simple and obvious way that we score hockey games, which is the number of pucks and nets, right? I want to I wanted judge a municipality's results based on keys and doors. Pucks and nets, keys and doors. You figure out how to do it. It's not our job to micromanage how cities increase their housing stocks. Some might sell land. Some might get rid of zoning procedures. Some might get their bureaucrats working faster and smarter. Some might allow more renovations of homes into uh, uh, duplexes. Some might, do, uh, might find any other manner of creative ways to do it. It's not the federal government's job to micromanage. What we're going to do is pay for the result, and that's how we're going to get the homes built, so that just like when I was minister and housing was affordable, it can once again be affordable in the future, and our young people can, uh, can uh, hope to get married and start families, something that has become next to impossible in most of our big cities. Madam Speaker, these homes are going to be in safe neighborhoods. This Prime Minister has unleashed crime and chaos with his catch and release system that allowed the same 40 violent offenders to do 6,000 crimes in one year in one city, Vancouver. A common sense Conservative government will make re repeat violent offenders ineligible for bail so that they stay behind bars rather than reoffending. We will bring jail and not bail. We will bring in treatment not more drugs for our addicts, that we can bring our loved ones home drug-free, and we will reverse the Prime Minister's ban on our sports shooters and our lawful hunters and instead go after the real violent criminals and seal our borders. We're going to put those billions of dollars he's wasting going after lawful hunters and put that into scanning the boxes that come in and out of our country that bring the drugs and the guns and to scan those shipping containers that are taking away our stolen cars so that we can stop them from leaving the country and keep our cars here, keeping our getting our insurance rates down uh, so that people can afford to drive again and they, can, they don't have to sleep with one eye open uh, in this, uh, this uh, looting of our vehicles that the Prime Minister has allowed to happen. We're going to stay. This Prime Minister wants to protect turkeys from hunters, I want to protect Canadians from criminals. <laughs> common sense. Ma Madam Speaker, so th that is the common sense agenda of the Conservative opposition in this forthcoming Parliament. Axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, stop the crime. Axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, stop the crime. This is something on which we should all agree. So I call on the other parties to dispense with their radical ideologies and plans and unite around this common sense effort to set four clear priorities. Who is ready to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime? Is everybody ready to do that? The 
I'd like to introduce the following amendment, that the motion be amended by deleting all the words after the word that and substituting the following. The House declines to give second reading to Bill C-59, an act to implement certain provisions of the fall economic statement tabled in Parliament on November 21st, 2023, and certain provisions of the budget tabled in Parliament on March 28th, 2023, since the bill fails to repeal the carbon tax on farmers, First Nations, and families. Thank you.